If you're visiting with us today, we are this crazy all the time. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we enjoy uh, we enjoy church. Uh, we enjoy one another, and we're a family. Uh, God's given me a message for you today, and uh, we've been talking about divine guidance for a couple of weeks now, and how God guides us. One of the ways He guides us is by words, by His voice. By speaking to us. That's why I, throughout this whole service, I've been very sensitive to the fact that God has been speaking to you. Yeah. Even through Charlie. <laughs> or through the songs that Rob led. Mm -hmm. Or through the prayers that were given. There's a variety of things that God is saying. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that he knows exactly what to say to you. And so, through the Holy Spirit, he is speaking. And so, I want you to understand that as we go through this uh, scripture tracing of this whole subject on God speaking. And I entitled it, What Did He Say? Uh, what did he say? Uh, years ago, uh, again, I'm old enough, a lot of my stories are all about years ago. <laughs> okay, so I apologize for that. But I want you to know God is faithful all these years Amen. and I was pastoring a church about 40 years ago uh, in California and uh, we had a growing church there as well God had blessed us and we had built a new building and a variety of things we had quite a youth group in our ministry and our Christian school that uh, uh, we had in our facility we had a Christian school but Besides our Christian school, only went up to like this uh, eighth grade. And after the eighth grade, they went to a Christian high school about 40 miles away. And uh, so they would, these teenagers would come and they would commute. And they were going in their own cars. Or they would, you know, all kinds of ways. Parents would have to drive them. There was lots of issues. And one day we decided, the Lord just spoke to me and said, you need to buy a van. And uh, to, so you can haul these kids around, one of these 15 passenger vans. And I felt that in my heart, and a quickening that we needed a van. Now, I didn't say anything to anyone, except that same week when I felt that quickening, I got a call from a guy named Papa Noel, we called him. Papa Noel was a man who uh, owned a Chevron gas station out on Old Highway 40, out of Barstow all the way to uh, Arizona. And uh, he pumped more gas than anybody else in the state of California through his Chevron gas station. Because he was the only gas station. <laughs> but Papa Noel was a wonderful believer. And he called me up one day and he says, Pastor Wood, that's what they called me there. Very respectful. <laughs> No other way. He called me up and said, Pastor Wood, I want to take you to breakfast. I want you to know every time Papa Noel said he wanted to take me to breakfast, I went. Yeah. Uh, he asked me to come to breakfast with him. And so I went to breakfast and met him at the certain place, at the restaurant that everybody went to in Barstow, California. Yeah. And as we were eating there, he said, uh, I'd like to buy you a van. I said, you would? He said, yeah. I said, well, you know, the Lord just spoke to me this week that we'd buy a van. I said, well, uh, what, what should I get? And he says, you go out and shop what you want and bring it back to me, and uh, I'll write you a check. I said, okay. It's kind of like, what did he say? <laughs> I remember rehearsing that in my head. Did I hear him correctly? He's going to buy a van. Now, back in those days, 40 years ago, vans were still expensive. <laughs> a little less than $30,000 for a van. Now you probably pay 60000 for the yes. same thing. Yeah, more. <laughs> or more. Yeah. So anyway, we got to this, uh, to where I was out shopping, and I found a good used one. And I thought, man, this, you know, a, he'll be proud of me for this. So I brought to him, I had a purchase order from the dealer for this used van. He looked at it. He ripped it up. He said, I told you to get a new van. We don't want a used van. 
And sure, I said, well, do you realize, Papa, to know how much that costs? Don't worry about what it costs. Again, I'm thinking in my head, what is he saying? <laughs> Doesn't matter, just find a new one. Get that new, and I got a purchase order for a brand new one, and I forget how many thousands of dollars it was. Laid it down in front of him, and he pulls out his checkbook and his pocket all rippled corners on it, lays it down, and, and writes out a check for the total amount. And then I thought to myself, what did he say? <laughs> what was he really saying to me? Not to be satisfied with just getting by, but to believe God beyond my own personal mindset, my own expectations, go beyond. And God oftentimes, what he is saying to you and I is beyond what your norm is. A lot of us are stuck within our norm mentality rather than in a God mentality where Papa Noah was telling me and he told me later on as we visited many times after that that he wanted to teach me a lesson to expect God for the best yeah. and never settle for less. The kingdom of God is like that. And Jesus himself wants us to understand that principle. And then I was a pastor and I believed in God. I had faith. But it came to that reality that I needed to believe God for what God wanted to give, not within the limits of my mind or my experience of what I would expect, but what God himself would desire and expect to do. So what is it that you need? God has a word for you today that goes probably beyond your expectations, which goes beyond probably your mindset. And you're going to leave this service today probably saying, what did he say? Because it's important for us to understand this incredible principle. The first thing I want us to understand today is the power of words. So when you... Why? I, there's so many thoughts going through my mind at the moment because I've dealt with a variety of circumstances and situations in my life. But most of the time it always comes down to how I interpret the words that people have spoken or people say and how they affect me or the circumstance. Papa know what he was trying to say, what you probably tried to say to one another and whether or not the true meaning of what you're trying to say is really being the right words are really penetrating. Sometimes we don't realize the power of our words. Right. Proverbs is full of suggestions. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 21 says, He who keeps his mouth uh, and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Think of that. He who keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Proverbs 13, 3 says, he who guards his lips guards his life. The power of words. Again, Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Proverbs 15, 4 says, The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. Over and over again, our words have meaning, have power, have life, are words of death. And you and I have to become responsible for what we say and how we say it. I believe in the days in which we're living, our yea needs to be yea and our no needs to be no. We need to know exactly where we're coming from and how we want to express ourselves and make sure that we are expressing what we feel God is wanting us to express. Words are important. They're so important that Jesus uh, printed the Bible with red letters. <laughs> how many have a red letter edition? So you know if you started reading all the red letters, those are supposed that by translation, the words that Jesus has said or that he speaks. 
I think it's important, not only that we understand the power of words, watch your mouth. When I was a very little child, we sang a chorus in Sunday school. Yeah. <laughs> watch your mouth, watch your, I always said wash. <laughs> watch your mouth, watch your mouth, what it says. Watch your mouth, watch your mouth, what it says. There's a father up above, looking down in tender love. Watch your mouth, watch your mouth, what you say. And I like my version. Wash your mouth, wash your mouth. <laughs> and then it goes on, watch your hands, when it goes through, watch your eyes, what they yeah. see, etc. that little chorus. Yeah. I actually have that on our wax recording from probably 70 years ago or more of me singing that to a, at a family jamboree where they would record things on wax records back in those days. I literally have that same record today in storage. It's pretty amazing how they would record in those days. We've come a long ways. So we have to watch our words. How many agree that's an amen? amen. Secondly, let's talk about Jesus. Wednesday night I've, I've been studying this, so I came up with a chorus that is as old as I am again, another chorus. Uh, let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings is he, the Lord of lords supreme throughout eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the light, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Like that? Yeah. Well, give me a hand. Come on. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going way back on some of this stuff. Words have been around a long time. I remember I was in high school, and I thought it was cute to cuss. And I was the preacher's kid. And my coach said, uh, pulled me over one day, he says, Randy, your dad's a pastor. And, yes, coach, he is. And blankety blank, I said something stupid out of my mouth. And then coach said, uh, I don't want you to speak Bible language anymore. And he made reference to the fact that the words I was using were biblical words, that I was using as slang or a cuss word. Craziness, isn't it? But let's talk about Jesus. I think a good illustration of this is in the book of uh, Luke, if you turn to Luke 24, we find uh, Luke 24, the, the guys that are talking on the road to Emmaus, remember? After the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, they're talking. And they're talking about Jesus. And it's important that we talk about him. And it says these words. I'm going to read a few uh, words. I'm going to jump around a little bit on this 24th chapter, starting first of all in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. This is 24 verse 13. 13 NIV version, okay? Uh, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Words, talking. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? So let me ask you this question. When you're walking with one another as fellow believers, what are you talking about? What is the thing that is your main subject, your conversation? About the latest, uh, sorry fishermen, the latest fish that we caught? Are you hunters, the biggest elk I got? or? Others of us with a variety of things. I just won't pick on those people. But, you know, we all talk about those kinds of things. And that's wonderful. I'm not putting down any of those experiences. But it's important to, have, to be able to witness and say how often we've talked about Jesus Christ himself. And what he has accomplished. And what he did. And Jesus wanted to pinpoint to these guys. I want to know what you're talking about. What's the discussion why are you so 
concerned about what you're talking about. And they stood still, their faces downcast, verse 18. And one of them named Cleophas asked uh, him, Are you only a visitor in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened uh, there in these days? What things, he asked. Jesus is wanting them to clarify what they understood, what was really taking place. I think it's very important that all of us need to clarify what is God saying to you. Be specific in your conversations. Be specific. What is God saying to you? If you use one word, one sentence, one subject, what would it be? God is telling me today in this service that it's time for healing in people's lives. God was telling me today it's time for restoration of marriages. It's time for healing in relationships. God is speaking to me. Jesus is here today to minister to you in your area of need, whatever it might be. And he's saying to you, if you have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to you. Yeah. And respond to it. He is saying specifically to you a word of life to you. He does not speak death. He speaks life. And we need to respond to the words of life that he is sharing with you right now in your spirit. There's a word. There's a word. There's a word. Jump all the way over to verse 25. And he said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? So he brings it to a point in their mindset of he's telling him they're all depressed, they're discouraged. Wherever you might be in your circumstance, you listen to voices of negativity. You get discouraged. You get depressed. You start feeling lonely. Those are all tricks of the enemy. You can't stay there. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you believe what the prophets have said or don't you? And if you believe what the prophets have said, you wouldn't walk around with a long face looking like you've been sucking noodles through a gas pipe. <laughs> Deep theology. <laughs> Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wow. Sometimes we have to re be reminded of the full theological base of why we're even here. And what God is saying. What is his word said to me in understanding the scripture as a whole? And that's what Jesus is trying to describe to them. Now I like verse 30. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread. Now watch this incredible transformation. He took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. Wow. Look what happened when he was at the table. I'm going to tie it in with our text in just a moment. In Revelation chapter 3, in verse 20. That's a table setting too, but look at here in verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open. There's something about that moment of relationship that takes place that we see Jesus for who he is. You see Jesus for who he is. Jesus said these words. If you go through John chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man go to the Father but by me. I am the Savior of the world. I am the resurrected Son of God. 
Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Jesus said these words. Do we believe what he has said? Do we receive what he has said? Does it change our attitude and our heart's desire to hear more about him? Does it cast away your worry? Does it take away your discouragement? Does it let you know that he hasn't forgotten you? He hasn't abandoned you. He loves you more than anything else. So we always have to, when we hear his words, words always, like I had with Papa Noel, they demand a response. Papa Noel said, uh, go get a purchase order. When we hear Jesus saying that he is all these things, and the scripture's telling us, and you read the red letters over and over again, all the things that he has said, and he is saying over and over, and he's thinking, talking to each one of us, we have a requirement to respond to him every time. We must respond. It demands a response. The scripture tells us that his sheep will know his voice. And when we know his voice, according to John chapter 10, when his sheep know his voice, they will follow him. So I must ask you, you can say, Pastor Ray, yes, I hear God's voice today. Are you following him? That's what he requires from us. The sense of being obedient and responding. And knowing him, following him. Wherever he leads, I will follow. Where he leads me, we sing, I will follow. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is God. Come home, response. Come home, response. I must talk about him more and more. I must talk about his divinity. I must talk about all that he is. Hmm. Revelation chapter 3. Excuse me, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to close here in just a moment. You're being so kind and patient. Hope you're not too hot. Is it breezy enough for you? We're going to have a new podium up here next week so I can spread out a little bit more. This scripture was in our bulletin and it's uh, obviously in your scriptures in Revelation chapter 30. And we're talking about the church of Laodicea. Revelation chapter, 19, uh, chapter 3, verse 19. I'm going to start there. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, the Lord says. Red letters, that's how I know he's talking. So be earnest and repent. So again, when he speaks, we respond. Every one of us, there's no excuse. You are required to respond in some way to him. Here I am, he says. In the NIV version, it said a little different than King James. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. That's interesting. So let me say this. Did you notice the disciples that he ate with at the table when he set the table and broke bread with him back in Luke that I read you in 24 what happened their eyes became opened when they spent time with him here he is asking to come and have a time to sit down I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me what I believe he wants to do with every one of us he wants to become a new revelation in your life. He wants to reveal to you his plan, the future. You have a future. You have a future. Turn to somebody and say, I've got a future. 
I've got a future. There you go. You gotta know you've got a, a future. We do have a future. It's important that we understand that. There's two things that have to happen here in this scripture, and we're going to close. Number one, we have to hear. He stands there. He's standing here right now. And my desire is that you're hearing him. I pray the Holy Spirit is whispering, speaking, yelling, whatever he has to do in your ear and in your heart. And I pray that you hear him. Then the second thing we have to do when we hear him, it demands a request to open the door. Open the door. Now I'm going to pause here just for a moment about the whole door stuff. I think it's interesting. Because some people, you hear the Lord, but you haven't opened the door. And my curiosity is asking me, what's keeping you from opening the door? What's keeping you from allow, turning the knob and opening? Because the door is all in your hands. Jesus was not <coughs> kicking down the door. He could have. He could have blundered away. But he's knocking on the door. And he's asking you to open the door and invite him to come in. Then I thought about this. What is it that's keeping us from opening the door? What is it? Is there a root of bitterness still that I don't want to surrender that will allow him to come in and reveal himself to me? Think about what you're missing by not opening the door. Is it depression? that's keeping you from opening the door? Is that a bad relationship? A bad marriage? What is it that's keeping us from opening the door? Could it be pride? Could it be rebellion? Could it be just plain secret sins? Your closet experiences. I'm getting real with you, aren't I? But the importance of understanding this principle and knowing that you have the obligation or the responsibility, not necessarily an obligation, you have the responsibility. You have the choice to open the door or keep it shut. And if you keep it shut, you'll go to hell. If you keep it shut, you'll never know who Jesus really is. It will be the barrier between life eternal and damnation forever. Jesus said, if you will, open the door. If anyone, and that's anyone, within the sound of my voice, if opens the door, then I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And to him who overcomes I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Church, we have a responsibility to open the door. We as a church generally we are here to open the door so the power of God can flow in this tent or in our chapel or on this property that you will be a different person. You walk on this land. You will know the power of God is here. And that God will change and will open the door. Those that prayed this place into existence over 100 years ago, 128 years ago, prayed that God would bring Salvation to this community from this hilltop. Amen. And that same prayer is fervent today. 
and they were requesting 128 years ago to open the door. We today are saying, don't shut the door. Open the door that we might receive all that God has in store for us and that we might be said of us that we are overcomers because we have heard his word and we responded. What did he say? He said, if you'll open the door, I will come in and I will sup with you and I will declare you an overcomer. Listen to this. And he said, then you will sit with me. Think of that. Oh, God. I don't know about you. I want to sit close to him. He'll allow me. Will you sit with him and claim that we have become overcomers? The enemy hasn't defeated us. Our homes have not been destroyed. Our finances are okay. God is in control of all that's taking place. I'm at peace with that. So Lord, I take the doorknob. I turn it. I open it. Jesus, come in. Jesus, come and sit. Jesus, break bread with me. So like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, I may see you for all that you are. Jesus, I pray to you. You are the one who loves us, cares about us. You have a plan for us. But that plan requires that we respond to you. I feel you, Holy Spirit, wanting to speak to us. And I pray that you will do that right now while your heads are bowed. First, I'll ask if maybe you're not saved today. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And today you would like to receive him as Lord and Savior. Receive Jesus into your life. Invite him to come in. Open the door to him to be your Savior. If that's your desire, would you just raise your hand so I could see anyone in this place in Jesus' name? Yes, thank you for that hand. Others, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Several have raised their hand. Let's pray this prayer together. Everyone out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come into my heart. Into my heart. I, believe I believe you are the Son of God. Son of God. I, now I now receive you as my Lord and Savior. Lord and, Savior. and I will live for you. And, and I'll talk about you <laughs> the rest of my life. Of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for purchasing me by your blood. I believe in you, and I want to serve you the rest of my life. Amen. May there's others here today. There's so many things that I feel that the Holy Spirit wants us to do to minister to you. But maybe there's decisions about your door has only been partially opened or that you, you know, you're, you're dealing with some of those things that I've even mentioned. Maybe some things I haven't even mentioned. But you don't want anything to be hindered or be between you and your Lord. And you would like further prayer. Would you just stand just from where you are right now? Just stand up immediately. You want to have, you want to make sure that that door is totally open. You're willing to surrender whatever it is that's going on right now. You're like, yes, 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 all over this place. Others standing. Yes, things in your life. Yes, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yes, others. Others. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Lord, you see these are standing. 
I pray now in the name of Jesus. You will minister. Lord, that there will be a sense of just setting everything free. Total kick the door wide open. Here you are. Here I am, Lord. Let nothing hinder our relationship. I want to know you more. I want to know you better. I want to see Jesus only in my life. Bless those, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together, shall we, Judy? You come.